This is Spartan 117. Anyone hear me? Over. Isolate that signal. Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. Welcome back to Finish the Fight, a Halo podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Reiners. And I'm your host, Alex Kendall. And as always, let's go over just kind of what's been going on with Halo lately. So first and foremost, Halo 2 Anniversary and Classic are both on PC now. Mm -hmm. Apparently it's buggy, but we kind of been hearing that since Reach and Combat Evolved at this point. Yeah, and and you're going to have it. You're basically fully rebuilding it for a computing system. So you'll have it. They'll they'll iron it out as much as they can. Mm -hmm. It is kind of interesting. There's a couple YouTubers who have done an original 2 PC version. Versus this MCC version on PC. Interesting. Um, so yeah, I, I, I clicked on a little bit. Didn't care enough. But <laughs> if you guys do, check it out. Go check them out. But we also have uh, some supposed leaks keep coming out like every few weeks. And mm-hmm. it's it's almost kind of hard to keep up with. And at this point, supposedly 343 is reaching out to people who are leaking and saying, hey, just an FYI, that's not really what the story is. So kind of take that with a grain of salt. Yeah, because we talked about this earlier, or at least Jesse and I did, that could be 343 covering their tracks and be like, oh, don't trust the man behind the smoke and mirrors. <laughs> or it's, you know, legit like, hey, please don't spread mis- you know, rumors because that may hurt us on launch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If people want a different story and they're like, 343 changed it because it got leaked or they're like, no, that our story was never that. Yeah. Like, please don't believe that. I so ho- I hope not, because uh, from what I've read, the few that I've caught a glimpse of, it's bad. So let's the, hope not. Well, that's the thing. The only real leaks you need are Animal Crossing leaks, so just keep that in mind. Are those uh, high right now? Oh, my God. I cannot wait. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot wait. All right. So with that being said, let's talk about the topic at hand. We are covering Halo 4 Forward on to Dawn. Now, that's technically the real name, Halo 4 Forward on to Dawn. We're just going to call it Forward on to Dawn for the episode. Yes. So they, they basically linked it to obviously get the press and marketing to go along with it mm-hmm. to give an intro to possibly some of the characters in the game mm-hmm. that you'll hear about. Yeah. So let's talk about the movie. And it's technically a web series. And also a movie, we're just going to call it a movie Mm -hmm. for the sake of just simplicity. So Forward Onto Dawn is the first live action web series slash movie in the Halo franchise. This movie revolves around Thomas Lasky while he's in boot camp surrounding his training in the beginning of the Human Covenant War. For five weeks, a new 15 minute episode would air on YouTube, Machinima and the Xbox website starting October 5th. 2012. In 2013, it would be released on DVD, Blu-ray, and on Netflix. I think you said you watched it on Amazon. Yeah, too. It's, it's pretty much on every platform, and Amazon mm-hmm. has it in the episode format, or so you're in your episodic format, or you can watch it in the movie format. And like Jesse said, they range in times. It's average of 15, somewhere mm-hmm. like, I think one's like 14, one's 19. So depending on how they've kind of split the, mm-hmm. oh, last time on this series yeah. type stuff. So if you're watching the movie, it's probably a shorter distance. But I watched it episode by episode to kind of let it break down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's go through the cast and crew really quick. Stuart Hendler is the director. And then for executive producers, we have Josh Feldman and Lydia Antonini. Writers Todd Helbing and Aaron Helbing, so they're brothers. And then... Or cousins. Who knows? They're brothers. They're brothers. <laughs> <laughs> you you had me worried for a second. I, I was know, like, I was wait, like, did I, like, I check? Did I, did I check? <laughs> yes, they're brothers. <laughs> and then, so for Thomas Lasky, is played by Tom Green. Anna Popwell plays Kyler Silva. Daniel Cudmore plays the Master Chief physically. And Alex Pusinelli, he does the voice acting for Master Chief. We also have Masam Holden, who does Michael Sullivan. Anisha Brewster, who is April Orensky, Ayelet Zur, who is Mahaffey, Ian Belcher plays Vickers, Jen Taylor voices Cortana, and Mackenzie Mason does the motion capture for Cortana, which also translates to Halo 4 as well. And to obviously steal the quote over from Jesse, the meat and or potatoes of this, we're going to get into how they were able to come together and create the movie slash web series itself. Ever since the plug was pulled on the Peter Jackson Halo movie years ago, fans would speculate that a true Halo movie would never see the light of day. But obviously, we're all still hopeful about it. After Microsoft would release a live action trailer or ad for upcoming Halo games since then, fans would want more and more live action in Halo. I mean, we saw that in Halo 3 marketing. We saw that a bit 
uh, with some other like in betweens, ODST mm-hmm. reach and stuff like that. So it was really nice to kind of see little tidbits they pull out just to kind of see what they could actually do mostly with the Covenant, because that's really mm-hmm. where we're going to see a lot more of the CG aspect of it, whereas the humans just play more of a futuristic war movie at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 343 Industries would look back at all of the live-action trailers and see potential in a full-length feature to not only promote Halo 4, but be its own standalone media release. 343 would then talk to the marketing department to iron out the budget But overall, it was 343's decision on whether or not it would happen. They would look at Ford Unto Dawn not as something that would be profitable, but an overall investment in the Halo universe. A.K.A. just Halo 4. Yes. They're like, (laughs) yeah, it would be for the whole franchise. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Give us that money. Give us that sweet money. Yes, for Halo 4 specifically. (laughs) But... In late 2011, Microsoft would decide to look for directors for the film so that pre-production could begin. Microsoft looked to Stuart Hedler to direct the movie after hearing his pitch for it, but would hire a production company to scout out all the rest of the actors. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad they did that. <laughs> Microsoft would have the final say in who the production company would hire. We kind of saw this in our canceled Halo games and projects episode where Microsoft really wanted to be the ones who are saying yes and no to basically everything. And I think a lot of that was probably Microsoft being hungry to be like, we need a movie studio too. Mm-hmm. We got a game studio. We got a, we got a computer studio. We got a music <laughs> studio. We need it all. We need everything. Mm-hmm. So when Hendler would start to work on the film, he would work very closely with 343 Industries to learn more about the games. He did have a history with the game since he first started playing it in college. 343 Industries gave him all the information that he could handle within the 100,000-year timeline with the books, comics, games, etc. Basically any kind of media that they had. Mm-hmm. Maybe even Halo, the... Uh, interactive strategy game over there what? they probably made him play that for like a week straight uh, it shows <laughs> by the end of the forward onto dawn production he would state that he knew more about halo than anyone really should so like most projects hendler and his team were given a considerable amount of creative freedom with the project but 343 industries did come up with the overall story and having todd and aaron helbing write the movie itself When the Hellbeings were interviewed for the writing position for the film, the original pitch was to actually make the movie set on Harvest. This would show 343 Industries that they had an understanding of the Halo universe. It's kind of like when you go to a job interview and you you over-educate yourself on the company, Mm -hmm. and you're like... Uh, yeah, I, I guess Earth seems fine with it, or I guess this other planet does, but honestly, I really think Harvest. I don't know if you've heard of it, <laughs> but I think Harvest would really be the, 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 the setting with the Jotuns. Uh, the, the, the Jotuns are there as, as well, we, we know that. <laughs> and it just it's one of those things where it's like, oh, okay, I mean, whatever you want, I don't really care. Just produce something for us and make a Halo 4. <laughs> <laughs> so Hendler decided that a good period in Halo's timeline to create the film would be during the Insurrectionist War, considering that it was at a point in Halo's history that didn't have a lot of information, mm-hmm. and he also wanted to create episodes that were as interesting as if they were standalone shorts. So I think it was a strategic thing to go, okay, I need to find a point that's not popular that way, if I fudge anything up, it won't be too terribly major. <laughs> that way, if I get anything wrong in the lore, only hardcore lore nerds would kind of understand it. Mm-hmm. Everyone else would be like, yeah, 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 good job, good job. Essentially why Halo Wars takes place where it does, because Bungie is like, don't touch anything we've done yet. Pretty much. So moving on with the movie, they're getting things running, and the movie would officially get greenlit January 2012. Filming took place in Vancouver at the Simon Fraser University, which would last about five weeks, eventually wrapping up in July of 2012. A month afterwards, 343 Industries would watch a rough cut of the movie, expecting to have a mountain of edits. After five minutes into the movie, they gave up and threw it away. No, just kidding. (laughs) That's what I would have done. But after five minutes into the movie, they said they put their pens down and watched the rest of it with little to no edits. Executive producers Josh Feldman and Lydia Antonini both had to do their fair share of research when it came to creating Forward Unto Dawn. They would research past media along with watching old live-action trailers and ads from Halo 3, ODST, and Reach. 
they felt like they couldn't do the movie unless they created something that would be up to par with those live action trailers. So both Feldman and Antonini said that they would love to work on a Halo live action project again and praise 343 Industries and Microsoft on how they tackled this project. Now we're going to start moving on a little bit into how the actors and actresses got involved with this. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say, and I talked to Alex about this, I've never heard so many different sides of the story not sides but retellings of re kind of how they, they did their yeah thing. and how everything was kind of different mm -hmm. sometimes some of the times they would say oh i didn't read any books and the other times they said oh, i was given this book and sometimes they're saying i was given every book and then i played this game but then they actually list off two different games it's it's weird but you had kind of said that it was probably like earlier interviews they said they had never read any of the books but then they were told hey Say you did some, you re read some of these books for research. You know? Yeah, and it could have been like during a press tour. It's it's kind of like if you're doing a Marvel press tour, and mm -hmm. you know you're, you're you're Tom, and you're basically revealing every secret of Marvel ever. Yeah, that's essentially what's going on. It's basically they're trying to like, no, no, you you love Halo. You you've been Master <laughs> Chief for Halloween every year of your life. You know who he is. Yeah, but according to Tom Green, when it comes to preparing for his role as Thomas Lasky, he actually wasn't given any Halo material to reference since, according to Green, his character had never been in any previous Halo media. He has stated, though, that he was given contact harvest and did read some of it, which that logic is weird. Like, you've never shown up in the lore before. Don't worry about research. Yeah. <laughs> Who says that? Who says, all right, so this is going to be our first real game as a studio by ourselves. This is our first huge, huge media pitch. The first movie we've ever done in this franchise. Swing it. <laughs> That's exactly what was said to him. So he was familiar with Halo, though, and even knew about the original Halo movie that was supposed to come out, but really knew nothing else about the series as a whole. On his own, he would play the games and get familiar with the universe. This would lead to him looking back at his high school years for inspiration for Lasky, more so than the Halo games itself, because he remembers when he was a teenager at one point with conflicting views with his peers, since all of his friends were football players and he was a ballet dancer. So that's cool. Yeah, so, so it's, it's the classic kind of like, haha, I'm a jock, haha, you're ballerina type stuff. So it's just like, it's the real dumb high school stuff. He's calling mm -hmm. back on that. And you can really tell in this movie. <laughs> uh, but over to Anna Popowell, she had never really played video games. So she was daunted when she accepted the role. Handler would send her all of the Halo books and games to get her up to speed on the Halo universe. Uh, because when I have two weeks to prepare, I can just play all the games, read all the books, and I'm fine. Never played a video game in my life. Yep, give me that Xbox controller. <laughs> Let me try and use two sticks. <laughs> she dove into the Halo lore, but only had time to read Contact Harvest and watch any Halo-related videos she could so that she was up to speed. I'm really interested if really all they did give them was Contact Harvest. Yeah, because those are the, some that always come up. Because if, if you were given the array of books thus far, I mean, you're talking about, what, 12, 13-ish novels and, like, different graphic things you can pick up? Uh, yeah. If you include the point, graphic yeah. novels, and it's like, Contact Harvest. Well, you also got to think it's probably close. It is first contact with Covenant, and this is happening right around I totally the same agree, time. and you're talking about insurrectionists and some of it, so totally understand about mm -hmm. the militia aspect of it. However... Don't say they gave you everything and you just happened to read a little bit of Contact Harvest. <laughs> so jumping back over to Popwell, she was blown away by the amount of depth the Halo universe had within the books alone. Popwell was told she would had to play the games or she couldn't be in the movie. Sucks to suck. Haha, -ha, you never <laughs> played video games? Best of luck getting through these things. <laughs> And she's just like, I can just watch it on YouTube. I can watch like a speedrunner playthrough. You know, she you just have like to typed, suffer. She just typed in like, what is Halo really quick? And like the lore videos weren't as prominent back then. So she's like, crap, well, crap, well, crap. And you know, her agent was, do you want to be in this sci-fi shooter movie? It's like a mini series. It'll really jumpstart your career. And she was in Narnia. Mm, yeah. I think. Don't quote me on that. She yeah. was in Narnia. I mean, I guess she's in the sci-fi stuff. So I mean, I guess this was probably a project where it's like, yeah, you need to. You need to do this. Yeah, because the Narnia movies aren't a thing anymore, sweetheart. We need to get you back to speed. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Yeah. And then jumping over to Daniel Goodmore, who played the Master Chief. So he is the Darth Vader of this, basically. Mm -hmm. Was actually familiar with the games. He said six years ago, prior to his girlfriend, now wife, bought him either Halo 2 or 3. He stated in interviews that it was 2, and then another one he said 3. Yep. 
So he just goes, I've played the Halo. <laughs> I've played the Halo, man. You know, and she she had bought him originally to kind of impress him. Like, mm-hmm. I assume it's kind of like that, that gamer knowledge, like, hey, bought a game for you. Mm-hmm. It's popular. He's like, I wanted Madden. I'm like seven foot tall. Nope. You get Halo. <laughs> and then this was the only game that he would ever play front to back. Years later, he would get a secretive call about a possible role. A role that allowed him to wear a really cool suit with hype and secrecy and to be very tall. (laughs) (laughs) Regardless of the cryptic description, Goodmore eagerly accepted the role, which he would later find out was to play the iconic Master Chief. He would research about any and all things Halo had to prepare for the role, mainly focusing on the fall of Reach after he read a script. Kudmore was thrilled to play the Master Chief and was most excited about wearing the iconic suit, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know, and obviously he has the best of both worlds. Doesn't have to do any voice lines because he didn't voice them. He he didn't have to make them serious. So he did do them when they filmed, but it was like he could have been like, go over there. Like, it doesn't matter. Exactly. (laughs) He's still still interacting with the actors, Mm -hmm. but he's just... And now I assume he has a Mickey Mouse high-pitched voice. (laughs) Um, And I don't know how anyone took this seriously, so kudos to the actors. But yeah, he, he obviously didn't have to have his voice lent to it, so his mm-hmm. lines could have kind of just been a portion of the scene to advance the other characters, whereas his was more of the motion and everything that went with it. Mm-hmm. To further help Kudmore, or Kudmore get into the role, he would go through rifle training. Legacy Effects would take a full 360 scan of his body so that the suit they built for Kudmore would fit it perfectly based off of approved artwork sent over from Microsoft. The suit seen in the movie is the exact suit of armor Legacy Effects made. So it's pretty cool. I'm assuming it was, it was touched up slightly in post, but it's what they made. Yeah, I mean, if you watch like behind the scenes, it's it's pretty much it. Like yeah. there's not much more they did. Yeah, it's you, pretty impressive. It's, it's just cool. a little it's I assume it's probably just a little touch up in post, mm-hmm. but like nothing that like that he was wearing it. So well, it's not like, like an Iron Man situation from the neck down, he wasn't, or shoulders down. Exactly. So mm-hmm. so they, they made sure that that worked out, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. And so no pieces of the armor were added in post-production, like we just said. It was more so the light touches, some little fill-ins, things that were imperfections mm-hmm. on some of the aspects of it. And in total, the suit weighed 63 pounds. Yeah, well, in the lore, it says it weighs like 1,000. So which one is it? Which um, one is it? It is 63 pounds total. They're actually just very fat people in there. <laughs> holding them together. Kudmore was able to somehow miraculously do all his own stunts in that suit of armor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he would get a chance to play Halo 4 going against some of the game testers. He said that he couldn't walk two feet without getting killed. And since then, he has stated that he is trying to get better at video games. So, so they hurt him there. He just sucks. They hurt him. All these people suck. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I'm very bad at Halo 2. Well, you're just bad at Halo in general or, or most games, but I will give it to you. You do a mean Pictionary. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so all the actors actually had to go through two weeks of military boot camp before they would start filming with a drill instructor. So that's pretty crazy, and I don't know how much of that method acting goes on usually, but... I mean, in good movies, yeah, they do that. In this one, they gave him two weeks. <laughs> this would end up being a bonding experience for the cast. The cast was also given the documentary Surviving West Point to watch for a reference for their roles. I've never heard of that movie. I'll assume it's about West Point. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically going through mm-hmm. boot. It's just going through boot. And it's kind of like, it's just a documenting aspect of how boot goes, how people go through that, what mental aspects of it, what actually goes into, quote unquote, surviving it. Yeah. So, and then when it came to all of this, Anna Popplewell had this to say. It was pretty intense. It was definitely the most intense thing that I've ever done physically. They had a really crazy assault course, rifle drills and marching, and a lot of push-ups. We ended each day with 10 push-ups facing each other, shouting, I love my rifle, at the top of each push-up. It's pretty intense. Only 10? Well, you know, they're eating custard (laughs) and having to watch different Halo playthroughs before that in basic. <laughs> no, I assume that was just saying, like, at the end of the day, once you're dead tired, you just have a ritual 10 to hopefully end it with. Uh, maybe they hopefully did more, according to her. And of course, the production team also had a military advisor on set to make sure, you know, obvious aspects of military training, because obviously this is supposed to be the UNSC, but still maintains a lot of Army and U.S. Marine 
aspects to the training and the whole aspect of basic in there. Mm -hmm. The advisor would point out that Chief would always be conservative with ammo and never fire indiscriminately. Unless Chief saw his target, he wouldn't fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was one thing that were probably like, just shoot everywhere. Because if you notice in the movie, he only fires at things when they pop up. Yeah, and, and there's never like off-camera fire really. Mm -hmm. However, there's... Oh, here's a spoiler alert. There's a part where Chief is running along, like, a, uh, what would you call that? Sidewalk? A sidewalk, like an, up, a, an upper sidewalk, just firing the Magnum without ever reloading. I wasn't counting, so I can't. I uh, can't yeah. <laughs> Fired like 30 rounds. Okay, well, it depends on what era pistol it was. Or maybe he got the, uh, the, the Halo CE pistol from Cursed Halo. Whatever. But anyway, it's supposed to be a CE pistol because it's obviously still at the start of the Human Covenant War. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Whatever. Anyway, let's get to some trivia for you. The movie cost $10, millies, $10 million to make. The five parts released online would be taken offline December 4th since that's when they were getting the Blu-ray release and mm -hmm. obviously wanted to go ahead and sell that. The movie was available, of course. Everyone knows their favorite marketplace, Microsoft's Zoom Marketplace. Mm-hmm. It's where you get all of your very old media for about two years. And some of the cameras on set had little silver Mark IV helmets on them. Little, little cute things. Little, little tidbits there to say, hey, we're thinking about you guys. Hey, we're wasting money. <laughs> <laughs> and Weta, so Weta Workshop, who had previously worked with Microsoft on the Halo movie before it was canceled, created a drivable warthog for the movie. And Weta's pretty much worked on... Every film, mm -hmm. it feels like. Lord of the Rings, like all these other different aspects. So kind of cool that they came back with that. Mm -hmm. Legacy Effects wanted to work on the project so badly, it was rumored they lost money on the project going over budget to produce the best props and armors they could. Glad they're still around. Rest <laughs> in peace. And there were about 500 shots in the movie that needed CGI add-ins. And you'll see that if you've ever seen it, Obviously, with any of the Covenant aspects that came in, any of the flyovers that involved like those great scenes of seeing mm -hmm. the base itself, plenty of aspects that you're going to see in any sci-fi movie mm -hmm. added in. So now let's talk about the marketing. So Ford on the Dawn was Microsoft's largest live action investment at the time, and Microsoft would state that though Ford on to Dawn does have marketing ties to Halo 4, they wanted Ford on to Dawn to be a standalone release in the Halo universe. I really think it was just to hype up Halo 4, and it worked for me, actually. So, And this is the first time I've seen it. I wish I didn't, but I did watch <laughs> it. So it was interesting to see, to play Halo 4 first, and to see like, oh, okay, this is kind of interesting, and gives you a second start to the game, but a little bit more info on who you're with. So I, I did like that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Comic-Con 2012. Fans would not know who was working on the project besides from Microsoft and 343 Industries, considering Microsoft wanted to keep a tight lid on anyone involved until it was announced at Comic-Con 2012. Mm -hmm. And fans were able to do a meet and greet with the cast and crew along with 343 Industries employees. Now, moving on, let's talk about the Halo 4 Limited Edition. So... Fans who purchased this would receive a 90-minute extended version of Ford Onto Dawn, and this copy of the film would also include behind-the-scene features and a special featurette called Bringing Gaming Into Reality. All of this totaled over 60 minutes of bonus content. Now moving on, we have the limited edition statue. This thing is cool. McFarlane Toys would create a small limited run of a 13-inch wide by 7-inch deep statue depicting a scene straight from the movie when Chief was on the hunter's back getting ready to shove the grenade in there. Spoiler alert. So only 500 were ever created, and they were sold for $225 a piece. And the statue would ship December of 2012, and it, only when it shipped were the customers charged. So I think the pre-orders were like six months prior or something. Most, most toys or pre-orders on certain aspects of that will be six to eight months, possibly nine to a year out, uh, depending on who's producing them. And it's more of, it's kind of like a Kickstarter guarantee. Mm -hmm. You're like paying up front, but you're not until it kind of comes through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then finally, there was a Toronto premiere party. I couldn't find any other information about this. The only reason I knew about it is because I read an article with Daniel Kudmore and they said they talked to him at a Toronto premiere party. 
Yeah. So that's all I know about I it. I assume they went around with a couple different press. Like, obviously, mm-hmm. so there's plenty of press kits for it. So I assume they had a couple different aspects I w- going with I will it. say that there was a, uh, at one of the, the red carpets or premieres, there was someone in a Master Chief uh, uh, suit of armor. And it was like the cheapest looking thing I've ever seen. So it's clear they didn't have a dollar to spare to this once it was done. They're like, uh, uh, go beat up some cosplayer and take his Master Chief. <laughs> Just w- shoot. Well, I mean, I guess cosplayers have an even better one than they did. <laughs> uh, now we're going to jump over and give you a, a kind of a quick, dirty summary of the film itself broken down into the original parts, mm-hmm. uh, starting with part one. Part one was released on October 5th, 2012. And it opens, and each one opens with uh, a portion of Cortana kind of talking over, giving you some lines from the start of Halo 4, Mm -hmm. uh, kind of talking to Chief while he's in cryo. Yeah, and this changes because, you know, each one when it's broken out is Cortana, but then if you do the movie, Cortana's at the beginning and end. Exactly. Yeah. So so it starts with that, and then we get to see a man that we don't know too much about yet. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's an older man kind of sitting over a ship who seems to be getting these signals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from from Cortana, this is forward onto Dawn. Help, I don't, I forget what they're saying. Yeah, so so she's basically sending out a Mayday signal. I'm with the Master Chief, basically. And mm-hmm. you kind of see, like, his eyes light up. Yeah, so it, it cuts to who we now know is is Older Lasky, the Lasky mm-hmm. that we're going to kind of meet, who is going to be there to save our boy, potentially. Mm-hmm. We don't know yet. You know, we're kind of figuring this out. And so it, it cuts to a zoom in, like, on his eyes, giving this kind of dramatic feel to it. He kind of, like, closes them, clenches his fist, and then boom. We're out in the fields, and we are in what we've seen kind of described in the books as training. We're mm-hmm. talking about like the, U- the UNSC training. Yeah. And we're with a couple cadets with some of the worst camera cuts in the world. Well, well they first they wake up from cryo sleep and then go out into the forest. Yeah. So you all see like they wake up from cryo, and it gets more detailed as you go through the episodes of kind mm-hmm. of what that regiment is, because it has them coming out of their cryopods, puking up their cryo guts, and we have little Lasky still staying there. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Lasky, you okay? Like, what's what's up? And I think he checks his wrist at the time or wherever he has an injury from the cryo. Mm-hmm. And he like, has like, he, you see there's blisters on his Yeah, body. he's all blistered from, he's not doing well with cryo, and he's developing a respiratory issue with it. But we see him go out, and we see them group up, and they're... I don't, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know if they're just playing like a Slayer or if it's like a capture the flag for I, this one. I think, and, and before we even know that, it, it almost is like, it, I mean, if you've seen any cat trailer, it's obvious, but it plays out as like they're almost actually in some kind of combat role. I think that's the kind of the illusion they were trying to give. Yeah, and the one issue I have to start this is they're trying to tell me they're like Ray-Ban knockoff sunglasses are actually their HUD. Yeah. <laughs> and they have like this HUD that you're seeing that like you saw in like ODST, mm-hmm. like a mini map and some like other different heads up display aspects on it. And it's just, it's kind of goofy. It's to give you guys a quick summary of the movie. It's kind of like if you took like P, like Percy Jackson or like Maze Runner, like any of those like made for teen films, but made it a little bit worse, which is kind of hard to do. It's kind of how this one's shot. <laughs> <laughs> but so they have this heads up display and you see him with two others. One member gets shot mm-hmm. and originally it looks red. But if you kind of know, they're basically playing those stun paintballs, stun rounds. They go down, they leave him behind and it's Lasky and this other girl. They go and meet up with everybody behind this bunkery. I thought it was like a rock. log or a tree. I can't it's remember. Like, Cause they like built some of those out and there's like, yeah, it's like concrete bunkers. Yeah. Almost. And there's like mirrors and stuff. Uh, Whatever. There's a bunch of different weird stuff in there. They meet up, and we see then Lasky and Vickers start to argue over what their strategy should be. Vickers, the the squad leader, right? He's the squad yeah. leader for this. I believe Lasky was previously, mm-hmm. but they kind of bicker over it that you're not the squad leader anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think that's because of his sickness and a couple other things that's happening. Anyway, they, they bicker, and it does that movie drama of checking the HUD and seeing that, oh no, there's more red dots getting closer to your blue dot position. And... At this point, Lasky's like, we need to do this pincer maneuver and this other thing. Here we go. So Lasky runs out 
for no reason. He just runs out. And it, I, I will say it is a reason be, it's just because it ties into the end of the movie. But at this point, it's only there to give the end of the movie that cool <laughs> yes. little parallel. That's it. It is. So he runs out and then their teacher, he like, gets shot. He gets shot by what is she? She's like the I, main squad leader. I think so. I think she like oversees them because she think like trains them. I yeah, think. she's like their trainer. So she shoots him and then he does some quip. And then she shoots him like four more times in the chest mm. and then ends the exercise. Oh, well, you got to think of the best. You want to talk about some teen angst is when he's talking <laughs> to his buddy who is like the worst actor on earth. I'm sorry, dude. He, his, but his buddy's like, my hand is numb. And he goes, I'm always numb. <laughs> <laughs> he tried and to I pull, did try to pull a Hulk line. And I've never noticed that until fight. Cause I watched it today before we recorded. And I was like, Oh my God. I was like, come on. Yeah. They try and play up like that, that, the angsty, like I'm just, I just can't handle what it is. I just, <laughs> that's just who I am. Cause we, cause we will eventually learn that all these cadets that are in this specific group are all from either higher ranking UNSC members or from rich families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like it's it's like your family or your mother was this higher up general or your dad is this this squad leader or, or of these ODST, something I don't, I don't know the exact logistics of it. Something I do want to point out, and, and anyone who has served in, in the military or, or anything like that, please let me know if I'm correct on this. All of the female officers are referred to by sir. And I looked this up, and that's a no-no if I'm correct. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but that's all the female officers, like that, that commander and everything, they're all referred to as sir. And I guess that's a huge no-no, which is, I feel like, a weird detail to not mm. fix. But again, if, if there's anyone in the military who knows you know, whether or not that's correct, please let us know because I'm I'm very curious. But but moving on from that, we are we we do see that we're at the uh Corbulo Academy of Military Science. And as you had said, this is where people from prominent military families come and they're gonna get their training and kill some innies because because at the time we find out that this is during the insurrectionist war because we actually see that Lasky and Kyler get into it a lot because she's very you know pro this cause and he's very like very much like why why are we killing these people why can't we just talk this out yada 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 yeah because because Kyler's more much more on the aspect of like well they're basically they're the bad guy they're the ones who are causing all of this harm and mm -hmm. we get a little bit of backstory on her but the assumption is that her family's been affected by it. Mm -hmm, yeah. And then that, that's one of the biggest reasons for it. So, yeah, so we get to know a little bit more of everyone at the Corbulos Academy of Military Science. So it's kind of where we're going to be based around for all of this. Mm -hmm. And, of course, to give you guys a little bit more background, we have, you know, Kyler and Lasky and everyone else that's with them are all part of Hastati Squad. Mm -hmm. uh, so that you'll hear that throughout the movie a little bit. And so it, it, it we kind of wrap up this first episode with... All of the study squad having to march back to the base. And while they're on their way back, we have a warthog pull up and the general hops out. And he basically says, I'm ashamed of you. Like, you come from these great families. Like, but in reality, why'd I even take you in? Like, you're just kind of rich or like just privileged kids. Like, you're mm -hmm. not going to make it. Yeah, exactly. He gives a speech about a Roman general or a Greek general, I believe, as well. I also love that at one point you see this statue of like this spartan like real life spartan but he's mm. also holding the assault rifle yeah. from halo so yeah so some of the, the the parallels they have with it it's it's interesting mm -hmm. and i will say i do like the layout of the base it's it's kind of cool it is futuristic but also they got touch screens they do but it's also just weirdly forerunner in a way you in think in some of the way that they've built out it, it, it's laid out exactly like a lot of the halo maps well, yeah, you don't have to design a new place. <laughs> exactly. That's pretty much what it looks like. And this is where we get a little montage of the different characters of a study squad. You know, you're looking at one of them who is like his friend and like the hacker who's like getting into all the all this classified video footage of like mm -hmm. people dying and people shooting people. And mm -hmm. yeah, his roommate, this girl is like, what are you doing? Like, you're going to get in trouble. Yeah, because her mom's high up at Oni. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, ah, oh. he's like, don't tell your mom. She's like, I won't. Yeah, we have like... Vickers, who's doing uh, uh, handstand push-ups. 
we have another character doing backflips and karate in his room. Well, and then and he ends up being like the stereotypical like, oh my my I'm of Asian descent and my dad is not proud of me and I should be doing much better in school and like yeah because at one point he lies about an exercise that they have what's well, the one they just had because they all failed it oh yeah yeah and, and and he basically lies he's like I, I got perfect marks on it and I'm a perfect because I think he's also a terrible shot mm-hmm. and he's a terrible marksman and it's like get low marks on everything and he's like no I'm I'm really doing well dad like mm-hmm. you'll be proud of me yeah but and, and we see that uh, uh, Lasky he, it's almost like he's sending videos back and forth to his brother and they're starting a game of chess because his brother is an ODST. Yeah, and, he's, and he seems, you know, pretty jolly about it. Mm-hmm. Even though he's the tiniest, skinniest ODST I have ever seen in my life. Yeah, because it starts, like, the, so he's, he's sitting on a video, Lasky's sitting on a video conference with his brother and his brother's like, you need to check this out. And he like takes off his shirt and on his back, he's got the ODST emblem tattooed on his spine. Boy, he needs to eat a cheeseburger or something. <laughs> he ain't gonna last long out there. And, you know, and he's like, yeah, you know, don't tell mom. She'll get angry at me for this. Her, but her, her, yeah, don't tell her. Yeah, but you see kind of Lasky kind of like taking a moment with himself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is kind of where we start to wrap up the first part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then on to part two, which was released October 12th, 2012. It starts out with another training exercise, which we don't know at the time, because I, the first episode actually ends with, you see in the window in the background, something comes into atmosphere. You don't know what, but mm-hmm. something comes out of atmosphere. So then when episode two starts, these alarms go off, and it's like, everyone get dressed, get ready, blah, blah, blah. And of course, their commander is sitting there, like, giving them all crap, like, come on, go faster. I can't do a commander voice. I don't wow, know. That was, that was very good. I didn't know why I thought I could. But basically, long story short, is is a handful of people didn't get all their armor on and get their guns ready in time. So, of course, the general walks in, like, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. And he does say that Kyler was, she put her armor on just under the, within the time, just under the record of the Academy's record, which was Lasky's brother. Yes. Yeah. And this is where we reveal like just how much, because even the general like pushes a little bit and he's like, you know, since the best, since the best uh, Lasky we've had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it tell like. They're definitely digging at at all these soldiers mm-hmm. and then pushing in. And you, you kind of see that, you know, Kyler's getting those top marks and wants to really push Lasky to make him, you know, push a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And I think they also notice like his scarring and like his blisters and stuff. And it's mm-hmm. like, you should really go down to medical to get that checked out and see what's mm-hmm. even wrong with you. Like, yeah, you're disgusting. <laughs> well, I think you paraphrase the last part. Yeah, but it's it's important. <laughs> uh, and to backtrack a little bit too, obviously, we'll say this with each one. Each one does start with a little more chunk of Cortana talking mm-hmm. um, yeah. until we eventually get what we eventually see in Halo Four, like that red beam or red like kind of like scanner come across. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, we're yeah. like, what is that? What's going on with that? So Whoa. we're getting we're getting little little tidbits about you know some forerunner stuff with that, but we don't even know what that is yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But anyways, moving on from that, we are now in the mess hall, and Lasky and Vicar sit down, and their commander, and I don't know if you can actually do this at a military base, but their commander is like, hey, I had to work overtime because of your bad scores. Give me your breakfast. So, And, and, it, and it's, it's funny enough, she's the one who shot him to end, the, to end the exercise. Yeah, and she kind of ends up being a pushover later on in this movie, as much as a hard ass she tries to act like. Yeah. But so then Vickers who, you know, is the current squad leader, makes a comment to Lasky about his brother. Mm-hmm. And, you know, his, his, his mom is ashamed of him and really misses the brother, or some kind of comment. It, it basically reiterates the kind of comment that was made earlier, that mm-hmm. uh, he was the best Lasky we've ever had. Mm-hmm. And so Vickers gives it a dig, basically saying that, like, you're nothing to what your brother was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we hear was referred to his brother a few times, just mm-hmm. in FYI. But this ensues a fight. And actually in the background, you can see Frank O'Connor make a cameo as a janitor for whatever yep. reason. So <laughs> yeah. Frank O'Connor Why not? had to have such control of the lore that Frank O'Connor is now officially canon. He goes, he goes, if Stan Lee's going to do it, I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so they get in a fight. And you can see that overall Lasky is winning. And the, uh, what do you say, she's a, a general? 
the 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 this the person she's, she's another higher up yeah i don't w- remember what she's listed as but she's kind of like has a soft spot for lasky mm-hmm. and she she see that she's she comes up and breaks it up and asks lasky come with me and she's had a talk with lasky earlier where she kind of scolded him he screwed up that training exercise initially mm-hmm. so she she of course she pulls him aside and they do the cliche there's a soldier inside of you i know there is it's like ah come on just Shut up. Like, let's move past this already. He doesn't want to do it. I mean, hey, this is this is what they wanted for this movie. <laughs> but of course, you know, oh, there's a soldier inside of you yet. I know it. Blah, blah, blah. But then it moves on and they do like a classic trope of we're going to get this military lesson about this this really famous tactical military move. Where it's like, oh, instead of horses, we have ODST, so come yeah, on back and Yeah, because it's basically saying like, how the, the Romans were swarmed with horses, and it basically became, it's a pincer maneuver. Mm-hmm. It's basically like doing doing a retreat, like a false retreat, and then having another force come in behind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, of course, Lasky is still sitting there making little snarks about it, but they end up actually going, you know, it, it moves on to the next day, and they do a game of capture the flag. Mm-hmm. But right before they start, Lasky wants to take point. I want to be the squad leader again. So they're like, all right, it's your funeral. And so he actually ends up devising a plan where I guess the HUD is, the, the motion tracker is in the helmet. Is in the helmet. So he takes, he sa- tells No, everyone, no, let's take it back a little bit. Let's let's start this scene off right. Let's, let's do this justice. Okay, okay. He just goes, what do we do? Wait. We just wait. And he's like, and everyone's just like, Ooh, like scratching their ass and like just playing, like, literally playing with leaves. There's a dude playing with leaves. Yeah, it's like it's like instead of like being soldiers, they're like just doing what I did in T-ball, which is like drawing the dirt. <laughs> okay, I'm glad I'm not the only kid that. Yeah, did that. that's basically what it was. Like me and T-ball drawing in the dirt, <laughs> and they're not like staying alert. And it's just like, oh, he's not a good commander. And then he eventually says, "Take off your helmet." Like. Well, I can't take off my helmet. And of course, he has like this big smile. He's like, no, guys, it's okay. And then, of course, because apparently that's where like the motion tracker for each but, person But is. also, it's not a motion tracker because yeah. they weren't moving. Like, I don't understand how that, that HUD worked. I think it's just like a location tracker. I don't know. Because they wouldn't see the other ones until they moved because like whenever he was running in that first episode, he didn't see any of them because no one appeared on the HUD. So I don't know how this is supposed to fool them i'm not i'm not a scientist i can't tell you this you're asking the wrong person sorry i i I thought i thought in the movie the first two episodes could correlate (laughs) but either way so the blue team comes in so then they they of course they show up from behind them and they shoot them all and to take it back a little bit because like i keep setting the scene it was like a weird thing where like the whole squad who's attacking them all run up together and they go, huh? <laughs> and then that's when they get shot. Yeah. And so Lasky, of course, runs for the flag and it's slow mo because there's a lot of slow mo coming up and it's dramatic. And then all of a sudden he just collapses. Yeah. Because you realize, like, also to give you numbers, there was way too many squad members that they shot because first they wiped the entire squad we kind of knew out. Mm-hmm. And then they were just like one tapping. Like all these random people in the woods, it could have been some dude do- walking his dog, and like just everyone was getting one tapped all what over. You're walking your dog at a military academy. I, it could have been literally everyone in the universe because they shot like <laughs> fifty people, and their squad was only made up of like what eight. I. <laughs> it was dumb, but yeah. So he he collapses, and we kind of see that like it's like it's a dun 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 like heart, and you can see that he's passing out because he's disgusting and boiled, fade to black. Mm-hmm. But now we're on to part three. Of course, the only trivia we have for this is that Frank O'Connor made a cameo in this episode. So Frank O'Connor is officially canon. So just so you guys know. But part three, which was released October 19th, 2012. So Lasky awakes and he ends up getting some kind of tests. And we find out that he has a severe allergy to the cryo. To the cryo juices. Cryo juices. I don't know how that works, but he's uh, he's severely allergic to it. So it messes with his respiratory system. He can barely breathe. He becomes really, really weak. And, well, and it's basically like, it's a necessity. It's like, in combat, we can't deal with you like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he faces a point where he he can be discharged, like if he wanted to. The, that overarching commander gave him papers, said, listen, kind of almost like has like a tone about it, like, yeah, you know, if you, if you don't want to leave, you can leave, well, and I I'm, guess. And I'm very confused. The woman general, is that his mom? 
No, no. I thought it was, but it, I, I checked, and the name tag is different. Okay, and that's what I thought, too. I mm-hmm. didn't know if it was because of, like, a different marriage or what oh, it was maybe. supposed to say with it, because she always singles him out, and he, and he brings up, and the same thing with Vickers, like, your mom doesn't really care about you. Mm-hmm. Like, like yeah. she's, she's a high up in UNSC, so I didn't know if that's yeah. what that was to kind of throw us off, so it wasn't really apparent, like, Lasky, Lasky, like, I'm your mom. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't really sure why that was or what she related to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was always confusing to me, too, but I checked the name tag, so unless it's written somewhere else... I like it. It seems like a mom and son because there's like this tension between them, but I don't think it is. Yeah, because she really like wants to push him, or if you know she has some relationship with his brother and like knew him or knows mm-hmm. of the last I, I family. She, she knew his brother for I, sure. I know that she did because she brings up like, oh, you know, your brother was great. Like, you don't have to compare yourself to him, and like, but you probably should, son. You probably should. But we also see that while he's resting in bed, Kyler is watching these videos. And this is where we find out that his brother is actually dead. So he's watching these old videos of that his brother used to send to him because, you know, it was implying originally that they were just sending videos back and forth. But really, he's watching videos of his dead brother. Well, yeah, because Kyler comes in and that's when she says, like, why do you torture yourself with this? Mm -hmm. And he kind of says, like, to an effect, like, this is really the only thing that keeps me going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I want to I want to jump back a little bit is that Sullivan the the worst actor in history he you know he keeps he's the, he's the one that's the quote unquote hacker with the classified videos mm-hmm, yeah and, and originally they see that they're they hacked into the HUD video of a Spartan because mm-hmm. we see for some reason a Halo Reach Spartan three helmet pop up for whatever reason but whatever so they're like whoa because you know we see this Spartan just going through and kicking ass and killing a bunch of innies. But then later on, we see that actually in the reflection of the Spartan's helmet, we see an elite, which mm-hmm. I think th- that almost reminded me of Signs in a way. Yeah. Great movie, by the way. This is not so much, but Signs is a great movie. But kind of that tension of like, what do you see? Like, what can you barely see on, on the screen? And I think they did really, really well with leading up to First Contact of in, mm-hmm. in this series. Because mm-hmm. like you said, like seeing stuff fall out of the sky seeing this video of, like, a uh, Spartan fighting with Marines against in- insurrectionists, but then this other folk comes in yeah. because it cuts after that. Yeah, because c- at one point in the video, it goes from them fighting the insurrectionists to the insurrectionists turning around and shooting at the same thing with the Spartans. Mm-hmm. And so that's why they're all confused. But but that's, yeah, that, that kind of keeps getting layered in. But essentially... Kyler and Lasky have this kind of heart to heart where they're sitting there and he's debating whether or not he should leave. She's like, I think you should stay. And then they go in. All this time, there's been so much tension between them because throughout the movie, they keep arguing like children about the insurrectionists and whatnot. And we find out that Kyler's parents were actually killed by the insurrectionists. Mm -hmm. That's why she hates him so much. And for whatever reason, Lasky doesn't. But they've been bickering and there's like no chemistry between the two other than knocking on the sharing wall between them that's it yeah and, and i think lasky doesn't because i think he faults the unsc for his brother's death and not the insurrection probably yeah and i think it's more so that he thinks of you UN- not as the insurrection as like the good guys but as like they're they're just as bad as the unsc well, he, type. he talks about the unsc brainwashing all of them to just go fight which is kind of a you know a easter egg reference to the spartans mm-hmm. and, and 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 yeah so then we get to the scene and while they're meeting outside the grounds and they're still talking about like his future there, like they mm-hmm. share a kiss, which is kind of awkward. Yeah, it's kind of like it's like they go into it, but then the alarms go off and it's like this is not a drill kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because the alarms go off. So at that point, they all run into where the space elevator is. So they're all waiting to go up into the space elevator to leave because they're evacuating the planet for whatever reason. And they're, they're starting to notice the ODST are starting to drop out and get sent out. And they're like, what is going on here? And so as they're waiting, uh, Mahefi, who is the, the chick with her, her, her mom works for Oni. She's like, listen, 
you know, I can I can get us out of here. Or her mm-hmm. mom doesn't work for Oni, but she's still a higher up. She's a, no, I, th- I think she has relations with it because she's Secretary of uh, Fleet Com. Yes. I think that's what they yes. said. I'm very surprised I remembered that actually. Pat <laughs> on the back, Jesse. Great job. But so she's like, listen, I can get us all out of there. Like, no, 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 we can't just do that. So she's like, suit yourself. So she runs up the, to the soldier working. She's like, Mom, Secretary of Fleet Com, let me in, or you know, I'll I'll drop your name. And so he lets her in, and the elevator goes up. Right then, and this part, this whole sequence is cool. So right then, they look up, and it's like this lightning coming out, and all of a sudden, we see a bunch of Covenant carriers come into light, and it's like the classic, like the music stops, and he goes, what the hell is that? And then all of a sudden, they shoot the elevator and, Mm -hmm. like, destroy it. And this is where it gets kind of morbid but kind of cool because it's, like, realistic, is that as they're running for cover... You see bodies dropping out of the sky and like screaming and hitting the glass ceiling. Yeah. And then it cuts. So I think there were certain aspects they did well. Like when you actually see what a covenant invasion looks like from a human perspective, a civilian, not civilian, but a, not a Spartan or ODST perspective, then it's like eerie. I will say the trivia I had for, for part three is that that uh, that overarching general, I can't remember her name says the king and pawn go back into the same box once the game is over because, you know, that's something that Halsey's mother said to her at one point. So that was another little Easter egg that they threw in there. They're like, oh, let's uh, throw a Halsey quote in there for a character we're just going to ruin. Halsey point two. What if it is <laughs> Halsey clone? Halsey egg. We, we do know at one point there were clones out there. That's what I'm going with. That's in the canon lore now. Pause the clone. <laughs> so let's move on to part four, which was released October 26, 2012. So the Covenant are attacking the UNSC base. Of course, there are ODST and actual soldiers there. And the the Hastati squad is fleeing from this elite that they're seeing. And at one point, they run through like a courtyard. And we see that general that's been helping Lasky. And she gets shot down. Uh, pretty quickly by a needler. It's 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 a very very jarring crazy start to an episode because yeah. it, it it starts off. I can't be. I'm gonna compare it to this, but you know, in, in in Band of Brothers, whenever they're going through through several scenes where there's just so much carnage around mm-hmm. and it's just kind of that slow mo, like no one really knows what's going on. There's dust everywhere. People are dying. Yeah, it's very similar to that, and it's just like. You see that hectic, it's like you said, like that main general is like trying to help them out and talk them over here. And she just takes like a stomach full of needles. Mm, and then she's done. And she's gone. And like people are just like kind of looking around trying to figure out what to do. And somehow Hastati squad makes it back to their barracks. Uh, they make it back to their barracks. But there is an invisible elite, which I think it's a zealot one. For whatever reason, there's a zealot out there. And he's just going through and picking off candidates as they as he sees them yes because he's going through now like their sleeping corridor and each one has like this kind of glass door or at least a shatterable door that Mm -hmm. blocks the front of it yeah because you hear like smash going in Mm -hmm. smash going in Mm -hmm. it's going down the hall yeah and they they try to get to the weapons but doors locked and they can't but so eventually they do so so the rest of the squad kind of hides behind this one place but then vickers is a is on the other side of the hall and they can see the elite kind of looking around and vickers of course tries to be a hero gets shot down instantly well i'll say they're not seeing it look around it's invisible it comes out of invisible it comes out of cloaking it does turn around and just take out Vickers really quick and then turns around and sees the rest of the squad and is like and it was kind yeah. of like yeah it's kind of toying with him because he had his energy sword out and could pretty much see him was like putting it right up to like Lasky's mm-hmm. face you can hear him laughing too mm-hmm. and right then it's taken out all of a sudden and it drops down and who do we see the worst Spartan of all we see Master Chief and this is the first time we actually hear him talking Voice acting is okay. Not really. Yeah, he's, uh, you know, I I will say overall, we are going to see that uh, Daniel Cudmore, who obviously does the body work for Master Chief, does well. Mm-hmm. There's some moments where it's very un-Master Chief, in my opinion. When he points and it's like... It's like they make like a whole like frame of just him like pointing very dramatically. Yeah, because they really want to show off like... 
they wanted that moment where the audience is like, oh no, oh no, yay, he's Master a, Chief is he's here. A tank. He he lives. And so yeah, so 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 he gets there, you know, his radio's in, we hear him talking to Kelly, and he's like, mm-hmm. Kelly, I found some survivors were going. And so all we have left because we lost Junji Chen. So that was the kind of stereotypical Asian character that we had with his sad dad. So he was the first to kind of lead the charge out of the student rooms Mm -hmm. and was immediately speared. So that's what kind of allowed them to get into the armory. So it's down to four of them. And right now we are down to the remaining of uh, Hasti squad. And we learn the remaining on the planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is Lasky, Arensky, Kyler Silva, and Sullivan are the remaining amount of them. And Chief, of course, in this movie, they have to throw in his strength. So they were trying to rip open these weapon lockers earlier. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, they won't open to locked. And he just goes, smash. (laughs) It smashes them. And then it's like, because, yeah, as you said, he tells them, he's like, they're like, why are you here? He's like, you're the only survivors are like on the base. He's like on the planet. Mm -hmm. And so eventually at one point, for some reason, they added this scene where he goes off into the darkness to check and they're like (gasps) freaked out. I think I'll be back. I think it was a horror suspense scene or an attempt at it because we do see Kyler Silva. She's kind of like starting to kind of lose it. She's kind of curled up in a ball on the ground and and everyone else around them is like, we got to wait. With his coming back, isn't he? Yeah, and then of course we see some lights, and then he shows up, and then he asks which one's the best shot. Which uh, I th- Sullivan, it's a funny line. He goes, "You probably," because it is <laughs> yeah. true. But then they're like, "Kyler is," and so is Orinsky. So then he's like, "All right, we're gonna go get a warthog, and we're gonna get out of here." So it, in the search for the, they see a warthog, and in the search for their warthog, because they're walking out in that court field or the, that the court court. field. That's my new word. I love it. So they're walking around in that courtyard, and it, it is like you have some somber music, and you see all these dead bodies Bit everywhere. Smoke around, yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden, as they're walking, Sullivan gets hit with a needle round, mm-hmm. and as the second one comes in right for his head, Master Chief puts his arm out, blocks it, and starts shooting at them a bunch, and that's that. And he's like, "Go get, go get the warthog, go get the warthog." And then he also then just he just disappears. Yeah, disappears, and it's like, oh, and then. I love in the midst of this is that Kyler runs out of ammo, sees a carbine on the ground, picks it up, and you think she like fires once or twice awkwardly. So I guess she's like gauging yeah. the kickback and everything. But even then, it doesn't matter because then Master Chief is running, as you had mentioned earlier, down that sidewalk, headshotting all of it, them it's, with it's his such, pistol. It's such a useless aspect to it because thus far, the coolest scenes with Chief are when Sullivan takes one of the needlers to the leg and then Chief comes in and blocks that one going for his head with his armor, mm-hmm. brings him down. Cool. Chief gets some shots in on him. Pretty badass. Him now doing the worst run ever with perfect accuracy, firing from like what seems like 200 yards, getting these headshots on these Jekyll snipers. Whatever. It's sci-fi. It's sci-fi. I hate it. But of course, then they, they do a shot where, where they get everyone else in the Warhog and Chief jumps off this this, oh. this ledge from a story above and it's like slow-mo until he hits the ground because it speeds up the last second. It, it's slow-mo. It's like such budget, like CW show. This really is comparable to a CW show when it comes to budget and production. It, budget's much higher, but production, yes, is, is so rough mm-hmm. with yeah. a lot of this. And you're like, Okay, I mean, they. Uh, I will say, like the CGI elite they had it wasn't too bad, and like we see no. those jackals, and we'll eventually yeah. see some jackals later. Yeah, and eventually a different thing, but they're not too bad, and that's where yeah. you can see a lot of the budget and time went into. <laughs> yeah, which put, should put a little more in there, but <sighs> but yeah, they, they do get into the warthog, and of course, Chief gets in the back. And as they're driving, they see more and more jackals because they're out in the woods at this point. Yeah, because they've now made it, I believe, just off the base and mm-hmm. back to the training grounds. I well, think is where yeah, because they're, they're trying to yeah, because because they see bunkers later on because mm-hmm. they're trying to go to the landing point. Yes, because he keeps talking to Kelly and they're shooting at the jackals, which uh, I haven't pointed this out yet, but all of the Covenant art style is three four three's new art style, yes. of course. So just had to plug that in there because because if we're trying to say they're a different species later. But they were first contact. Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, that's how that's that makes sense. Three, four, three. Anyways, so off my high horse. 
they they end up shooting a bunch of jackals, and I didn't even realize this. You pointed this out because you texted me about the other day that Master Chief is shooting the gun mm-hmm. and the barrels aren't even turning. They did no effort to like CG the barrel. It's just a static <laughs> barrel on the warthog that Weta made that doesn't rotate. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like he's just firing these rifle rounds statically, and it's it's. I can understand like this movie with this show movie whatever was wrapped up pretty quickly yeah I don't, five weeks of production I, and i don't yeah and i don't know what their post-production time was or what they got in this or if this was like it's too difficult for us to try and clip that barrel and rotate it for each frame mm-hmm. but it was just kind of silly because they put the muzzle bursts and muzzle flashes from the rounds being fired but it's just like a static thing yeah so for like a chain gun i was like oh, okay whatever yeah. But but so they they do they take out some more jackals and then they end up hitting one and they stop mm-hmm. and then they just go again and that's the end of that part. Yeah, and, and at this time too, we we do see the little display in the warthog because we have Lasky driving and Chief's like you need to punch it and we see like that ramping of the speed that you do see in the warthog mm-hmm. and we definitely see like an air message start to pop up on that and it starts to slow a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, that's the end of the episode. We're starting back up with part five, released November 2nd, 2012, which is, you know, it starts out how you had, had said. And then they they stop and we actually see that Kyler was hit in the stomach with yeah, the needle cause, round. Because now that the Warthog's off, Chief is like, we need to go look at Sullivan. Mm-hmm. Like, I have yeah. some biofoam. We need to get his leg going because this Warthog's not going anywhere. We got to hoof it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and this is kind of, I think, where they wanted to draw the drama, why the kiss happened, why there was that tension, is it's one of those moments where she's kind of been silent the whole time, mm-hmm. and, you, and then the camera pans down, you see her kind of clutching her stomach, and you see, like, a broken needle round in her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she's just like, Lasky. 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 And he's like, he just has his beats on, and he's just jamming, <laughs> ignoring her. Producing. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's, so he's, he's like kind of concentrating on the warthog and figuring stuff out. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we'll take care of Sullivan. We got to get out of here. And that's when he looks. And then he starts to yell for the Master Chief. And Chief comes over. He's like, I'm out of biofoam. Uh-oh. Should have told me about this like five seconds ago, you idiot. Mm-hmm. But at that time, then they also notice that they hear the jackals are all retreating. And yes. so they're like, what's going on here? And Chief says, we're being hunted. They chose their words wisely there. Just <laughs> yeah. FYI. And so he goes, listen, just go to this 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 rally point. Don't turn around for anyone, including me. Just go. And so they run off, and you see from a distance, they look over, and you see Chief, and this this green light is glowing. And you see – this shot was cool because mm-hmm. you see him looking up, and in his HUD, you see a hunter. I was like, yeah. that's kind of cool. But then they pulled uh, – uh, uh, what is it? Uh, 2000 – 15 Godzilla, and they just really didn't focus on the battle. They focused on the people. Well, and you have to. If your budget's low like that, especially for CG, you have to pull it. And they they did make this, the hunter huge, which which I thought was mm-hmm. really cool. But they did make him kind of the size of the hunter in Halo Legends. Mm-hmm. One of the elite goes through and starts fighting. He's just huge when you first see him, which I thought mm-hmm. was really cool to show just how ominous that presence was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I thought that was just such, such a neat way to show it off, like you said, without really having to show the hunter moving or really any like very taxing processes for creating the CGI aspect of it. Yeah. So then we go over to the remainder of the squad and Kyler's dying and they're trying to figure out what to do. And, and they see, cause they're at one of their bunkers. They're, they're, they're at the capture the flag spot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so Sullivan with the most effortless line, he must've been filming for like 12 hours cause he goes, Look, stun rounds with just <laughs> no effort, and that yeah. line sticks out to me because I'm like, God, you are you are paid. I don't know how much you were paid for this, but however much bucks. it was enough for you to put a little more effort in that 20 line. Twenty bucks, but of course, you know they find some stun rounds, so they like because because originally we were out of ammo before, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. why like Chief was like, you guys got to go. Warthog's down. We're all dry. Mm-hmm. Like I yeah. got to try and figure this out. Yeah, so they pour him on her wound to to numb him, I mm-hmm. guess, and then she croaks. Yeah, so so she's like, you know, I'm not gonna make it. You need to do something with your life. Basically, kind of like last message. Like she pulls her dog tags off, gives him to Lasky, and it's mm-hmm. like, you guys need to get out of here. Like mm-hmm. you need to survive. Yep. And so Chief walks up, like, who dat? 
<laughs> but that was, yes. a, that was a bad joke. That but, was awful. But of course, you know, he walks up, says, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. And this is where we really see Chief humanize. And like, because mm-hmm. I think he's learning to respect these cadets. You know, they're, they're, they're putting the bravery in. They're driving the warthog for him. Mm-hmm. They're not constantly crashing to a wall like full-blown <laughs> Marines in the game. Mm-hmm. So it's helpful. And so he comes in and he asks them, you know, uh, I need some of your ammunition. I wasted it all on that big boy back there. And they're mm-hmm. like, we're out. Yeah, all, all that all that they can give is Lasky gives them a grenade. Yeah. And so that's when all of a sudden it's like, uh-oh, there's a second hunter. And so that's when I think I had said Chief said it's early, but he actually says it now. He says, go to the rally point. Don't he said, he said it both times. Yeah. He said it both times to where, like, you guys need to go. And then this time it was like, he's like, do not look back for me. Mm-hmm. Don't stop for me. Get to the rally point and get out of yeah. here. And this is where Lasky says... Okay, how about this? That I that idea is cool, but it sucks. How about this? I'm the distraction. I'm just gonna go hoof it. And she's like, "No, you can't do that." And so, just like the beginning of the movie, he screams Axios and runs to be the distraction. Yeah, which because we had learned that that was kind of that generally we talked about. Where Axios is kind of meaning like bravery, freedom, all this other stuff. And yeah, because he had that general take his own life or something. He was supposed to take his own life if he needed to. Yes, and so this is kind of him giving his life. To help for the one person who was able to fight this terrifying beast, this hunter. Mm-hmm. And so he runs out. And this is where we see the hunter cannon, the Halo 4 hunter cannon, mm-hmm. start to charge up and fires at him. And so he kind of cuts a beeline. First one misses him, but blows up dirt and everything around yeah, him. Yeah, he, he like falls over. Music stops. Gets back up. The dramatic, awesome music keeps going. Yeah. And then is it one or just two more? It's, it's one, one more it's, shot. It's one it's, more shot, and it knock, knocks him out. Knocks him out. It doesn't hit him, but it like yeah. glances around him. You see like some hair singed, uh-huh. got some cuts, and it mm. knocks him down to the ground, and he's out. Yeah, and that's when Chief, though, runs up to him. The hunter hits him. He falls back. He gets back up, does this. He, and he, he charges. He's trying to charge a third blast. Lasky's yeah. gone. We're, yeah. we're, like, Lasky's done for, obviously. A third blast. You know every third mm-hmm. blast in the game kills you. Yeah. And he he ends up getting crawling on the hunter, getting on his back, shoves the grenade in his wormy torso, does a cool backflip roll off. That's pretty sweet though. The backflip because yeah. it wasn't just a backflip like land for cool points. It was like a backflip roll to your feet go. It was kind of yeah. neat. And so then he stops, and then it explodes, and we see like one of the little like, Golo worms. He stomps on it, and I will say I love this detail. You hear the Halo theme in the background, mm-hmm. just very subtle. Of course, I think it's not the traditional monks that do it, but that was that. It's Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> it's Sullivan in the background, like, and that's not even him like singing the theme song. That is him, like, owling over his wound. He's just like, oh. <laughs> They so, kind of get it right. So that, that just ruined anything you would enjoy about this movie right there. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so they go, and, and Lasky's actually fine. Spoiler alert. Yeah, they, they go over to him, and at this point, I like this too with, with Chief. He's kind of got like all that like orange blood mm-hmm. across him from the like Golo worms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and it goes from glowing to kind of like flat color. Yeah. They, they, they end up making it to the rendezvous point, mm-hmm. and we see Kelly and Fred show up. For whatever reason, they're they have very Halo Reach esque armor. Yeah. For even though we originally the Spartans were sharing the same looking armor. Yes. And this is still supposed to be first contact. So it's supposed to be uh, yeah their first set that they're getting because yeah it's, it's supposed to be what they have. But anyway, anyway they 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 make their way to the Pelican and. You basically have each surviving member of Hostility Squad is sitting across from, like, their role. So Chief is, like, the leader. So Lasky sits across from him. And then we have Sullivan sits across from Fred. Mm -hmm. And then we also finish up. And then we have a Redsky sitting across from Kelly. Mm -hmm. And it... This shot is pretty cool. I do like that they do, like, the back and forth where the camera focuses on that cadet and mm-hmm. then turns to the Spartan. And they're kind of sitting, same posture, mm-hmm. kind of same yeah. feel to it. Yeah, because the, the uh, Fred and Kelly take off their helmets, and it's suppo- I guess they're supposed to be young. Because mm-hmm. I think they're 15 at the time in the lore. But yeah. They don't look that way, and for some reason they have really crazy eyes. They were wearing contacts, clearly, to make them have, like... Yeah, and it's... It's interesting, and I guess they're trying to make them less human 
and more of a Spartan, I guess, is really what they're trying to do. Like, say, like, they have heightened vision. Yeah, which is weird, because I don't think before this they've ever made a comment about their eyes changing, how it I, I, actually I, I, looks. And correct us if it's wrong, if that's in, like, the Fall of Reach or, or anything else with that. I don't remember if that's mm -hmm. ever a mention with it. I know eyesight's obviously changed in itself to be better. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, so they, they release these two babyface characters who have... I will say, like, they did pretty well with, like, the scarring mm -hmm. and showing that they've been through some stuff. And it kind of ends with a line. Is it from Sullivan? Yeah. Yeah, Sullivan asks, he's like, how old are you? Mm -hmm. And, they, and they, they look at each other. They do the cliche, they look at each other. That's classified. Yeah. But, but this, this part's cool is then it goes over to Chief, who is still on alert, has his gun pointed out of the Pelican. Yeah, still helmet on, spoiler. Not saying <laughs> anything there. But he actually looks over at Lasky, and he hands him a piece of that hunter armor. Mm -hmm. And he says, good work, soldier. But yeah, so he gives that over to him, and that's when it actually switches back to adult Lasky. Mm -hmm. And they ask, uh, they ask Lasky, do you want to repeat that message, the Cortana's message? Yes. And he says, no. And we see him actually getting into cryo. So after all these years, he still deals with his mm -hmm. allergy with the cryo. And we see that he still has that piece of Hunter and Kyler's dog tag. So he, yeah, and he carries those with him. One of the coolest things I love with it is that obviously these are mementos for him. And I think he like probably plays with him when he's nervous or something. Because, it shows him, yeah, doing that. Yeah, because it shows that the Hunter armor's worn down. Mm -hmm. yeah, as opposed to, like, when he first gets it, which is kind of sharp and jagged, mm -hmm. and, and it seems that it's worn down. Yeah, so it's like 30 years of him fiddling with it. So you kind of see that's kind of just, like, helps him mm -hmm. manage all the stress. Of course, you see that his body is still very badly boiled up and whatnot. Disgusting. <laughs> that's what you're saying. He's disgusting. So the, the movie finally ends with Cortana... Awakening Chief. Mm -hmm. So it's it's clearly the the Halo Four model for Cortana, and we see that she goes and she wakes up Chief, cue to black. Yeah, that's the end of it. That's, that's it. the end of Ford onto Dawn. I do want to add in this little detail though, is that the Lasky that we see, the older Lasky, they had to go in and change his eyes to match the color of the character of Young Lasky of Young Lasky and the the one in the game. And that's not his actual voice. They got the voice actor from Halo 4 to come in and dub that over. Mm -hmm. Which I, I, sure. I mean, it does help because if you're going to use Cortana, I mean, you didn't use Chief, obviously, but at the same time, you probably already had his contract still up available. So they're yeah. like, all right, you're going to do the game and also do these lines. Probably, yeah. So let's move on to cut material. There's not a lot that I could find, but let's talk about the few. So, of course, as I said, one of the original ideas that the writers had is that it would actually be a battle on Harvest, mm -hmm. which would be interesting. And then the other thing I could find is that Steve Downs was originally supposed to voice the Master Chief. So he was going to be the main man behind the voice in the film, and Downs recorded some lines, and the studio that recorded him would attempt to take his voice and make it sound young. So they tried to de-age his voice, sure, but it did not sound organic whatsoever. It sounded super chipmunky, I guess. It probably was because you already have like his deep kind of bassy tone, and to make it younger, you're obviously going to take a lot of that bass out. Mm -hmm. So it probably just sounded really flat and weird. Yeah. So they ended up, you know, as we said earlier, going with Alex Pusinelli for the voice of Master Chief. We'll get to this in my opinion, but I don't think it changed much. It still kind of sounds. It sounds like, like someone, Downs was doing it. It sounds like someone doing an impression of Master Chief. It yeah, doesn't sound like Master Chief. It sounds like an impression of him. And it doesn't sound young. So I don't understand what they were going for because neither does Kelly sound young. They all just sound like the character they are now, but with worse voice acting. Exactly. So let's talk about now the music because mm -hmm. we can't not talk about the music. Composer Nathan Lanier was actually very familiar with the Halo series, having played the games over the years. That aside, he said that what he looks into first when creating the music for a project is reading the script and figuring out who the characters are and learning more about it. He was drawn in by the emotional and gritty nature of the script. I guess that's what you could call it. I can't. I, I felt it was more teen angsty. I mean, it did change. Whenever the Covenant did attack, I will say that did shift the, the tone mm -hmm. of everything. And that's really where I got a little bit more invested. Obviously, yes, it's battles and stuff like that's pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. But it did shift the tone of everything and make it more meaningful than, ha ha, your brother died. <laughs> like, <laughs> it definitely changed it for the better, I would say. Yeah. 
So he wanted to create music that would blend in with the sound effects and truly be something that immersed itself into the movie itself rather than just being a traditional score. Now, when it came to Lasky's theme, which Lasky had his own theme, Lanier was heavily influenced by Tchaikovsky's fantasy overture from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, and some of Lanier's favorite tracks were Volcano and Sleep. Now, the original soundtrack would contain 21 tracks coming in at 58 minutes and 3 seconds. It would eventually be released July 10th, 2013. Now, if one were to have bought the DVD or Blu-ray, it would come with a 26-track version of the soundtrack. And with your release versions, you obviously had them released on the various websites as they came out. Mm -hmm. But after they were pulled offline, they were then given to DVD release a Blu-ray release, and your video on demand, Microsoft Zoom, baby, going through that, <laughs> you know, as, as well as just your other avenues on video demand with Netflix, Amazon, mm. and other aspects. And on YouTube, if you look it up, because it's also there. Mm -hmm. And let's jump over to what does this really do for the lore? A couple things. One obviously gives us an introduction to Lasky. That's the only one I could really think of. Two, it's the first visuals we ever see of the Covenant from 343. Okay, yeah. So I, I will say yes. You kind of, when you have hands mixed between Bungie and 343, yeah, you saw some changes. But this is the first kind of look that we're going to start to see of the idea of what their art style is going to be. With yeah, them. within the media itself. Yeah. Well, yeah, so not necessarily lore, but as far as like the lore of Halo in general... This is where we start to see that first change of them mm -hmm. and to see what we're going to start to see the art style be within four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about the general reaction. So Four Dawn to Dawn had to live up to not only the hype surrounding Halo 4, but all previous live action trailers and shorts previously released from the Halo universe. Four Dawn to Dawn would also have to fill that gap that would have been an official Halo movie. Mm -hmm. Critics were very quick to notice 343 Industries wanting to make Four Dawn to Dawn a more humanistic side of the war and not focus too much on Master Chief. Critics would also note the impressive quality of production of the movie overall. Now, while online, the movie would generate 55 million views, including post-episode discussions from Machinima, and 97% of the videos were liked on YouTube. Now, the movie would also debut number nine on the iTunes movie charts, which... Oh, oh boy. <laughs> so let's talk about some quick scores. IMDb users gave it a 6.6 out of 10. IGN would give it an overall 8.5 out of 10. Amazon users gave it a 4 out of 5, and Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 67%. So not rotten. <laughs> not rotten. And to give you a couple of awards, a couple of little nominations that the movie slash miniseries got, mm -hmm. we have the winner of the Golden Reels Best Sound Editing in Computer Episodic Entertainment, a nomination for Outstanding Virtual Cinematography in a Commercial or Broadcast Program, very specific, and then they just swept the Streamy Awards... Mm -hmm. with best drama, best production design, best cinematography, and best editing. So obviously, there were no contenders against them. Well, the, yeah, I definitely think at the time that web series were still pretty new. Yes, I mean, new. you have to figure, like, really against them was Red versus Blue and a couple others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and believe it or not, before this, Stuart Hendler, the last thing he did was actually a web series, which I think when some of whatever that show was, won mm -hmm. some awards that were both nominated for Ford on to Dawn in that show and vice versa with Ford on to Dawn. Oh, that's nuts. So, so yeah, he'd like, he, he was, he'd double he, was dipping. he was a winner either way. Oh yeah. So after the release of Ford on to Dawn, many would speculate that this was a clear sign that a true Halo movie would start to see the light of day. But 343 Industries would publicly state multiple times that there is no plan to create a Halo movie since any and all speculation would just quote, end up on Kotaku anyways. That was a Frank O'Connor quote. Frank O'Connor would also say that the title of the movie was a little misleading. Yeah, you think? You think? Because I've seen a trend. They just name stuff after their ships. <laughs> 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 All right. So that being said, let's talk about what we think about it. Mm -hmm. And of course, this one, we were kind of letting it spill out more often than not throughout the summary. But as always, Alex, please start us off. Let us know what did you think about the what, I was going to say podcast. What I think about the podcast, pretty garbage. But what as for the movie, it's okay. I'll give it an okay. 
it's it's better than most pieces of video game media mm -hmm. that have come out up until this time. I because you had I don't remember when Prince of Persia came out. But you had Prince of Persia, you had Super Mario Brothers, which is probably the best of them all. I've never seen that movie. I need to. You don't, but it's beautiful. <laughs> it's so bad, it's good. Um, and, and other t other people have touched on it, whether it's through c cinema or whether it's through animation. But I thought as far as production value and what you got out of it, it did well. Like I said, it did compare to like a Percy Jackson or yeah. to a Maze Runner or to any of those movies that were the teen angsty types. It fell short a little bit because um, mm -hmm. it is episodic. But overall, I think for the budget you had and the time space, it did well in those regards. Now, as for the acting, like you said, and some of the things they pulled, it's kind of like we got the casting call and we had enough to hire one actress who was in Narnia and everyone else just kind of they found yeah, real I, quick. I will say Tom Green, not crazy Tom Green, but this Tom Green, yeah. <laughs> Australian Tom Green, he was really popular in Australia, I guess. That's that's what I looked like. He, he was acting throughout most of high school. And, and he, he did okay in Lasky. I will say mm -hmm. he did do well. As far as all his other supporting roles, they did meh. The, the dude who played Sullivan was not a good actor. He reminds me of uh, a Junior from Breaking Bad. Yeah. It's literally That's, what he sounds like. It's pretty much what he sounds like. I had to look it up because I thought it was. <laughs> yeah. I had to look it up because it kind of looked the same too. Yeah. So so overall, like I, I think it passes as a piece of marketing material. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you rate this as a piece of cinema, it's much lower. Mm -hmm. But if you rate this as an intro to Halo 4 and a cool somewhat standalone piece that introduces it, I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I can agree with you there. There were some points, or there were some parts that were really, really cool. Uh, no ifs, ands, or buts. I think Chief fell a little short with how they did it, but there they still had some parts that tugged in your heartstrings. I think the action could have been a little better, but I mean, again, and I never thought about this till now, you know, they're look at it as a movie or a web series and look at it as a piece of marketing. Yes. And, and and to touch back on like the when you start off and it's kind of those quick cuts in the forest and it's mm -hmm. like a kind of a garbage battle scene, you know, for, from watching a bunch of uh, I don't know if you've, if you've seen uh, Corridor Crew or any of that stuff. They do like stuntmen react and they show how stunts are done and how you do good combat scenes and how you do bad ones. You do bad ones by having 30 cuts in one second, which is kind of the start of that. It's like, hoo, 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 hoo. And that's kind of what they do. <laughs> that's what they do in, in a lot of stuff. Like in The Boys, they do that on some stuff. And so it's not really well done as far as a combat movie, which is kind of what they wanted. But it's it's done well, like I said, as a piece of marketing material, introducing a brand new character that no one cares about. I like Lasky. That eventually you do care about. Well, the, my my freaking gripe with this thing is that they 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 made this so you can see the relationship between Lasky and Chief. Mm -hmm. When they're reunited in 4, Chief is just like, "Huh?" Cuz you see him like you think it's going to be like kind of like cool thing where he's like, "Oh, glad to see you again." And and you'd expect him to be like, "Lasky, it's, you know, Lasky, is that you or something like that?" Like, it's just something to acknowledge him and he just looks at him. I will say though that both Bungie and 343 are terrible with that. It's like when Romeo and Dutch yeah, yeah, and, like, and and Romeo's dying or could be dying, and Dutch is and just Dutch like, is like huh? oh, well, uh, <laughs> I guess we gotta go now. Yeah, versus the comic when he's freaking out because he can't find him. Yeah, yeah, and that's like if you're gonna make something where it establishes this relationship, you should probably acknowledge it in your next form of media that comes out within four days of this. Well, especially when you made this specifically. To show who Lasky was, and like you uh -huh. said, that there was chemistry that Lasky was like, that Chief respected him. Yeah, and, and furthermore, that Lasky has been pushing all these years because of his experience with Chief. He saw mm -hmm. what a hero was. Yes. And that's what he wanted to strive to be. That's what he based his whole career on. Yeah, and then yet when they see each other, it's just kind of like, uh, you're a guy, right? Uh, we're old men now. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, what? The, you know, and actually now that I think about it, I think that Technically, Lasky was older than Chief. Yes, they were. They were. They were yeah. older. Yeah, because oh, that's that's, that's, why, that's why they brought up like, "How old are you?" Yeah, yeah. It, was, okay. it was a joke that both of them were younger, mm -hmm, but, but that they were much younger than them. Yeah. So 
Yeah, that's absolutely crazy. I didn't think about it. I mean, overall, though, I, I think, you know, I saw this. I saw, okay, if they ever do this again, there's going to be potential. Uh, they squandered it with Nightfall, but, yeah. you know, that's a different topic. But either way, definitely I think it was something that was still cool. Still won some web series awards. So it won you those. can't get mad about that. You know, and, and it depends. Like, uh, I'll let you jump back in in a second, but it, we'll see how, like, the Halo TV show is going to be. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very wary that we're going to get this again. Hopefully not. I mean, hopefully you can take some elements of this, include it. And make it, you know, make a Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. Make it like that, that is a really cool Western set in Star Wars. Yeah. And make this like a really cool either combat or really awesome episodic show mm -hmm. that's based in the Halo universe. Yeah. So like write that first and then just slap Halo on top of it. Essentially, and, and yeah. incorporate them. It worked well for Mandalorian. Yeah. Very well. But I mean, overall, and again, the guy who voice acted Chief, he was not good. He got the voice down, but the acting itself was kind of not good. And I know you could say, well, how, how is that? Chief is such a boring character. Because he shows emotion like two or three times, and those times are dry. Yes. Like, they're bad. Like, there's a scene where, like, I think it's like Kelly's trying to, you don't hear her, but Kelly's trying to say, like, just leave them. And he's like, I won't leave them. But it's like, it just comes off so bad. Yeah, and it's, and it's. I'm a cinephile now, apparently. <laughs> well, and I guess he does it, too, more out of emotion and less of a strategic purpose. Yeah, I could see that. It was just, but 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 he doesn't. But it doesn't show. Yeah, like he's supposed to be kind of like it wasn't done well in that aspect. I, yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, but I mean overall, I mean you know if we're gonna talk about rankings, mm -hmm. let's let's talk about rankings. Let's say I, I'll I say I'm on the cusp with Rotten Tomatoes. I want to give this a six point five or a seven mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, it was just you know it. There was a lot of potential. There's a lot of things they did right, but there were some things like sometimes the acting was bad. Occasionally, like you know, you could tell that they had a low blur, like that they were running out of some budget because you don't actually see a jackal upright. They're all hidden behind bushes or they're all on rooftops in a distance away. And I think a lot of them were just copy and pasted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the only two things you see fully is you see an elite and you see one hunter. That's it. And yet they give the impression that there's. A Covenant army invading this. Yeah. So they fell short with that. So that's where they're going to get my 6.5 or 7 out of 10. But once again, if you do think of it from a post-production aspect of doing the computer graphics for it and creating things, mm -hmm. they did it very cleverly. So I will give that as well. They did show an elite, mm -hmm. which is pretty big as Zealot, so it was actually like decked out. Mm -hmm. They showed Big Hunter, and they did show an actual hunter and animated it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same thing with the jackals. You saw the jackal snipers, and we saw jackals with shields in the in the trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we we did see them, but like you said, they did make it out to be a grandiose battle when you really only saw one elite ever. Yeah. So that that was kind of my frustration with it. So understandable. If I had to give it a rating, hit me with it. It would probably be thirty six Halo CE pistol magnum rounds coming out of one gun, no reloads. <laughs> um, <laughs> Divided by the amount of Fs that Sullivan's actor gave, <laughs> <laughs> multiplied by the number of apples that were in the lunchroom that Frank O'Connor's janitor would have to clean up afterwards when obviously a food fight would happen at some point. Should it's a teen angst. It's a teen angst film. And then later episodes you didn't see, it's just a giant food fight. So, and then I would equal that all out to be a decent video game movie, but a bad movie ranked against the rest of Hollywood. Yeah. I'd say, yeah, if you think of it also as a video game movie, typically those are really, like, those are just bad. It's, flat it's, out it's bad. It's low budget or people go in thinking way over their heads for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they think they can just change a bunch of elements. Mm -hmm. And this isn't technically like a, a, a visualization of like a video game brought to real life. It's a movie within that universe. Yes, and it's done very well. I mean, I would compare it to a little bit better than some Resident Evil stuff that came out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's still within that realm. But yeah, as a video game movie, it's definitely higher up mm -hmm. as a piece of cinema and a piece of like, if I want to be like, oh, Jesse, what do you want to watch? You want to watch a movie together? Sure, what do you want to watch? That Halo thing, like I, I wouldn't necessarily put Ford Unto Dawn on my top 1,000 things I want to watch. <laughs> That's a big list. And there's, yeah. All right, but yeah, that was, so yeah, that was Halo 4, Ford Unto Dawn. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was fun. It was interesting. I did enjoy it. 
But let us know what you think. Mm -hmm. Check it out on the streaming platforms. Do it. But as always, want to go ahead and thank the people that make this whole podcast thus far possible. Mm -hmm. And that is our patrons. If you want to join our Patreon today, we have a link uh, all over the place in our Discord and wherever you're listening to this mm -hmm. or kind of watching it on YouTube. Get a link there for you. Mm -hmm. We have exclusive game nights or exclusive Discord, prints, uh, exclusive chats, uh, discount in our store, plenty of other things. And let us know if you are patrons or want to be, if there's something you want to see. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. trying to change it up a little bit, add some more stuff because it's, it's kind of stayed the same for a bit. So want to add some more. Mm -hmm. But as always, want to thank those patrons we do have with Alejandro Yaramil, Angry Canadian, Bretton Bagley, Charles Zitter, Cowan Fong Feliciano, D Gamer 1298. Dust Storm, Francis, Grant Dillon, Harvey Chong, James Gervasi, Jonas, Colonel Panic, Tactics, Dragonfire, Mr. Trolf, Pasquale Orozco, Skyjack, and ZZ Slipway. So they've been awesome. They've been supporting us a while now, which I absolutely love, and it's kept us going. Mm -hmm. It's kept us being able to do this podcast. Puts and food on the table. It puts one piece of bread on the table for <laughs> us to share, but we truly appreciate it. You guys are amazing. Yeah, and of course... You should check us out on any and all podcast platforms, but Spotify is pretty cool. Check us out on there. And if you do listen to us on iTunes, please give us a review because that helps us with the rankings. Of course, we're also on YouTube and anything else you can really think of. And don't forget to please go follow us or like us on any and all of our social channels. We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. We are on Instagram. And we have a Discord. I know we mentioned for our patrons, mm -hmm. we have a specific chat for that, but our regular Discord is open to any and all who want to join and if you're interested please message us on any social platforms or just check the link in the description on whatever platform you're listening to and it will be there and to wrap it up last announcement we just released a throwback collection it's been a year so we're doing a throwback of some of our previous logos that we've worked on for the podcast and some other really cool things at our merch store mm -hmm. uh, once again merch store is available either in whatever description you're looking at or just drop us a line on social for it. Mm -hmm. um, helps us out as well. And just let us know what you think of that. Yeah. And before I wrap this all up, I just want to say one last announcement. I have to one-up your announcement. Oof. We are finally going to be doing Halo 4. Mm -hmm. Halo 4 is in two weeks. This is one of the most requested episodes we have had for a long time. And I know at this point it's been like 10 or 11 non-game episodes you know we're not really counting halo combat evolved anniversary so we're glad that you guys have been sticking it out and you know this is probably our biggest episode that we've done yet and so again it's been one of the most requested episodes so we're finally ready for you guys to listen to it in two mm -hmm. weeks and with that i'm your host jesse reiners and i'm your host alex kendall and thank you for tuning in to finish the fight a halo podcast I think we're just getting started.